Michael Patrick Shields is on the air. Good morning, world. Good morning, Michigan. A very pleasant Friday to you. It's Michael Patrick Shields. Heard all across the state of Michigan. You know that uh, we were supposed to be broadcasting this morning from Marquette, from the UP200, that world-famous dog sled race, that uh, qualifier for the Iditarod. And uh, we are in our Gillespie Group storefront studio on the Avenue of Michigan, just a couple blocks from the Capitol, because... Marquette was fogged in yesterday. I uh, flew from Lansing to Detroit. I landed in Detroit at 1 o'clock in the afternoon to connect to Marquette and spent the whole day at uh, Detroit Airport all the way until about 10.30 last night when uh, we had to say no-go. Uh, there were no flights. We sat around and sat around and sat around, and they kept pushing back the flight an hour, two hours, three hours, an hour. So I spent the day at the Detroit Airport and then said, well, gee, how am I going to get home? So I luckily got on the last uh, Michigan Flyer bus and took the bus back to Lansing. Got home, I don't know, uh, 1 in the morning or something like that. So here we are in our studio. We will still salute the UP200 uh, as we go through this morning. But first, the major story, as you know, Governor Snyder has laid out his budget proposal to state lawmakers Big changes in how things have been traditionally done at the state capitol. And the governor said his plan is for two years, and it's much different than the previous budgets. They don't work well. They don't work right. They did at one point. But over time, they've become complicated. They've put in too many special interest items, and they don't support the future. Rick Snyder's plan cuts business taxes along with money from nearly every segment of government. That includes schools. That includes prisons. $45 $45 billion budget has no tax increases, but does call for taxing pensions for the first time. Snyder said Michigan is just one of a handful of states that doesn't levy an income tax on that income, and that needs to change. There was a recorded statement. Governor Snyder said his budget is not about line item spending and short term outlooks. Our system's different, it's about value for money. Snyder says his budget will work. We've got a comprehensive set of proposals to redo our tax system to focus on two things. First of all, job creation, and then secondly, to be simple, fair, and efficient. There are supporters this morning. The Michigan Chamber expressed overall support for Governor Snyder's approach to balancing the state budget without a general tax increase and repealing the job-killing Michigan business tax. Uh, Rich Studley, the uh, Michigan Chamber president and CEO, will join us a little bit later. The uh, Farm Bureau has weighed in. The budget recommendations announced today by Governor Snyder is a promising starting point for reforming state governor and rebuilding Michigan. And uh, they say Michigan farmers have been waiting for this kind of open and honest conversation about Michigan's budget for the better part of a decade. Now, I understand there are a lot of people upset by this budget as well, and we'll hear from lots of them this morning. Uh, State Representative Maureen Stapleton Stapleton from Detroit used uh, Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly's atomic bomb reference from last week and said this budget is an atomic bomb on the middle class. And uh, Mark Brewer, the chairman of the Michigan Democratic Party, says the budget represents a huge tax shift from big corporations and wealthy CEOs to students, senior citizens, the middle class, and low-wage workers, at the same time cutting education and other vital government services like public safety. Um, The uh, governor... Uh, says he wants to create jobs, this according to the MEA Director of Public Affairs, Doug Pratt. But he says you don't do that by slashing funding to schools that are preparing our children for the workforce. We need real, balanced solutions that can move Michigan and our economy forward. Um, These are some of the outcries that you're going to hear this morning. Um, This is revenue stealing. It will be impossible for some cities to survive under Rick Snyder's plan to eliminate $307 million in statutory revenue revenue sharing for a $200 million competitive program based on best practices. That, according to the president of the Michigan Municipal League, the board of trustees there. Uh, Anybody walking yesterday into the Bogey Tower, that building right across from the Capitol in downtown Lansing, was greeted by a crowd of state workers 
protesting, the union, the chants weren't friendly. Legislators get the gold mine, workers get the shaft. Union busting is disgusting, is what they chanted there. A 50 protesters rallied at the corner of Capitol Avenue and Allegan Street. Representatives from the AFL-CIO, the Michigan State Employees Association, UAW Local 600, and AFSME were all there yesterday protesting. Uh, Rick Snyder says he's not attacking seniors, but the AARP president, Eric Schneiderwin, said the budget declares war on Michigan seniors by eliminating the 100% homestead property tax exemption seniors currently enjoy. And uh, so they are upset at the AARP. Um, Senate Minority Leader Gretchen Whitmer, the Democrat from East Lansing, who will join us a little later, smacked Snyder between the eyes with her claim that the governor was playing the same old political game of putting corporate tax breaks ahead of the people. And she says Governor Snyder's idea of shared sacrifice means working families will do most of the sacrificing while companies will continue to reap the rewards. Contrary to his rhetoric about moving all of Michigan forward, this budget picks out who he's willing to leave behind. Speaking of sacrifice, the governor yesterday vowed that he's going to work for only one dollar as a way to set the tone for shared sacrifice. Uh, his uh, salary would have been 159300 He's going to give that back and work for $1. Uh, what do you make of that? Is that, uh, is that a sign that the governor really cares? Or is that a sign that okay, he's rich, he doesn't really need it? What do you think? Is it? Uh, do you feel a little pandered to by that, or do you feel buoyed by that? 888-900-9966 is the number to call. We want to hear from everybody who is touched by this budget. If you like it, if you don't like it, if you're a lobbyist, if you're with one of the state organizations and you want to ring in and weigh in, please do that this morning. There are a great number of legislators and lawmakers that listen to this program uh, on their drive from their various districts or while they're in town. They watch it on Fox 47. We want to hear from you. 888-900-9966. We were bombarded yesterday with press releases from various organizations, positive and negative, and we are reaching out to you, and we want to hear from you at 888-900-9966. What's bothering you about... Rick Snyder's budget, 888-900-9966. There's lots of other news this morning, too, but among the people who will be joining us, Randy Richardville, the Senate Majority Leader, will be with us as well, and various uh, state senators and, and representatives on where we go from here. But we want to hear from you at 888-900-9966. Now, Sarah Palin, switching to national politics for just a minute, was a guest of honor at a luncheon in Long Island, and uh, she's really taking after President Obama and not running out the idea or ruling out the idea that she may run for president. Here's what she said. What President Obama is doing and what this administration is supporting is America being on a road to ruin. She hasn't made up her mind for a presidential run, and uh, she's talking about short-sighted decisions. Unless we do take seriously this monumental debt that we are going to pass on to our kids and our grandkids, expecting them to pay our bills for us today for some short-sighted decisions. Sounds like Sarah Palin would like Governor Snyder's budget, too. She said it's time to stop playing games in Washington and focus on the spending. We're talking about our kids' future. We're talking about our republic and the solvency of our republic. School districts not happy at all with the proposed budget unveiled by the governor. Rockford Public School Superintendent Michael Scheibler said people need to pay attention to what's happening, saying the cuts are going to push many districts over the edge. They're already running deficits, and they worry that the latest cuts uh, will severely damage education. Grand Rapids Public Schools issued a statement after the governor announced the budget, saying it was worse than they had been expecting. Bill in Hazlitt is in the air at 888-900-9966. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Michael Patrick. What's on your mind, is, sir? Uh, Governor Snyder going to receive a tax credit on that give back of his salary? 
I don't know how that works. We'll have to talk with. Uh, we'll get maybe we'll get Craig Godfrey, the CPA, on the other end of our line and find out exactly what that means if he works for free. Good question though, Bill. He's listening closely and he's wondering. Our number is eight 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 nine zero zero ninety nine sixty six. Extensive coverage this morning of what the governor would like to do. His idea for change in the state of Michigan. Charles Ballard will be with us. We will ask him, Bill. Charles Ballard is the Michigan State University economics professor, and uh, he'll give us a breakdown of what it all means and whether it'll all pass. Now, the thing of it is, remember, this is a budget proposal. It's not as if it will necessarily pass the way it is, but the governor has said it would work if we just pass the whole thing the way it is. When we get back, the Detroit Tigers trying to figure out the next step after first baseman Miguel Cabrera was arrested on drunk driving charges this week. Uh, Dave Dombrowski uh, from the team, the general manager, says he's got an issue here that needs to be addressed and helped, and we're going to help him. But uh, no idea when he will be back with the team at spring training. We'll talk to Larry Sorensen, who pitched in the major leagues, about what happens next for the Detroit Tigers and Miguel Cabrera as they get ready to start spring training under now a cloud. 18 after the hour. Our number again is 888-900-9966. It's Michael Patrick Shields, and it's Friday. So the uh, Tiger president and general manager Dave Dombrowski says he expects Miguel Cabrera to be with the team, but he didn't say when Cabrera arrested Wednesday night in Florida, charged with uh, DUI and resisting arrest. Dombrowski said the uh, Tiger organization is going to help Miguel Cabrera. And um, position players are scheduled to report to spring training today. They're going to have their first full workout tomorrow. And uh, this uh, trying to work things out. Larry Sorensen, who pitched for seven major league teams and uh, was the voice of the Tigers on radio and uh, did some television for ESPN, now lives in Grand Rapids, is on the other end of our line with this uh, sort of breaking news yesterday that broke a lot of hearts, didn't it, Larry? Absolutely didn't. I'll tell you what, you broke my heart this morning, Michael, because I'm a senior, I'm 55, and I'm living up basically off my pension. That's my main source of income. Then the idea of Sarah Palin for president didn't throw me either. <laughs> but beyond that, Everything's um, coming up roses, really, huh? <laughs> really has messed up spring training for the Tigers when things were going so smoothly. They felt so good about things. The attitude was terrific. And now all of a sudden, this is going to follow them all summer long. What do we know about what happened? Well, essentially, he was about 100 miles away from both his home and from Lakeland, and that's one of the big questions, is why exactly was he where he was? Mm -hmm. The next question that is raised is he said he was going to kill somebody, which would indicate there was somebody else in the car with him, and, who, and I imagine that his defense attorney is going to say the other guy was driving, Miguel wasn't driving. Mm. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions that can be raised, and according to some of the things that I've read and a couple of people i talked to, there are plenty of loopholes that, you know, they're going to use if, in fact, it comes to that. Now, there's, there's a couple of different things going on there. If it goes to trial and he's convicted, then there's a much better chance that he'll do jail time. If he just pleads guilty and accepts whatever the judge says, chances are he will not do any jail time because first offenders generally do not get any kind of jail time. They get probation. They get counseling uh, mandates. They get probation for an extended period of time. He'll probably lose his driver's license for a year or so, um, so he'll have to get a driver. But um, there are a lot of different things going on that way. The biggest thing to me was his attitude, because it seems as if he still, you know, he said last year when he got in trouble, or two years ago when he got in trouble, I'm not an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Well, he is. He obviously is. And that's one of the first things that you learn as you go through AA. And, Michael, as you know, I've had my problems with alcohol. Mm -hmm. You must acknowledge that you've got a problem. And he doesn't seem to do that. They said he was cocky, belligerent, had an attitude problem, and resisted arrest. So he obviously does not think that he has a problem, but he does. Well, it's very easy for people to sit in judgment today, but, but they don't walk in his cleats or in his shoes or anybody's shoes who are, are struggling with that problem. Uh, even Charlie Sheen this week, who got a lot of attention from his interview on the Dan Patrick show, who said, you know, uh, the, be the worst advice he's been getting from people is stay clean, stay the way you are. And he says, well, that's all fine and good. Today I feel that way. Tomorrow I might not feel that way. So for people like Miguel Cabrera, this is a, this is a daily uh, temptation, a daily choice, and a daily struggle, isn't it? No question about it, Michael. And as you know, I am an alcoholic, and I go through this battle every day. And what happens is you start feeling cocky a 
about things. They call it the honeymoon period. Yeah. You know, you go through a period where you work hard at the program, you work hard with your counselor, you're doing very well, you think you're good, so you think, okay, I can have a beer. Okay, that one beer turns into swig and scotch in front of a police officer. And that's what happened with Miguel Cabrera, who we, who, as far as we know, was clean all the all the way from uh, it was two years ago when he was when the Tigers were going down the stretch there, had a chance to get to the playoffs, and he had a drunken binge on the weekend. And clearly, too, from that incident and this one, it's not just that he's going, you know, to the Lindell AC or out to the bar wherever it is and whooping it up. There are some sort of um, haunting personal problems too. You've got to believe that there generally is behind every alcoholic's problem. Um, you know, you don't do it just for the fun of it because it's not that much fun, and you always end up in trouble. Um, the saying is, I I don't always uh, get in trouble when I I don't always get drunk when I drive, but when I drive and I'm drunk, I get in trouble. Yeah. You know, so, um, well, you know, Charlie, if he was behind the wheel, and we still know for a fact that he was, um, although. You know, he, we're not sure exactly where he was when the police stopped. Mm-hmm. He did get into his car, grab a scotch bottle. So there are some questions about that. But he definitely has a problem. You can bet that they're going to have some babysitting him all summer long when he does come back. As I understand it, he needs clearance from a doctor from Major League Baseball in order to get back on the field, first of all. Um, this is still his technically his first offense. It's his second public embarrassment mm-hmm. and second public situation. But it's his first offense. So do you, do you think he will play this year? Yes, I do. I okay. do. It may take a while, but I think he will be back on the field at some point in time. But, uh, you, know, like, you know, it's funny. You and I talked yesterday, and I asked, you know, how excited can we get about the Tigers? And you and Dan Dickerson both said you can get excited. They got a real shot. How big of a dent does this put? It seems kind of trivial to talk about, I guess, when there's human suffering going on. But uh, how uh, how much of a dent does this put into the Tigers' chances of uh, being a oh, contender? It's, it's going to have a huge effect because I don't think he'll start the season with the team. Mm-hmm. I think he's going to have to go through some type of a rehab program, um, and I think that he'll he'll miss a part of the season, which is obviously going to hurt them a great deal. The big thing is it's going to follow the team around all summer long. Every city that they go to. Every reporter is going to want to talk to the players. Is going to want to talk to him, and they're going to have to set up, you know, a press conference to stay in each city. Um, and it's it definitely, definitely is going to have a negative effect on the team. And and like we said yesterday, everything was going so smoothly. The pitching staff was set. The only real question was at second base. You know, they had a lot of talent. They pared the payroll down. So they had to make a move. They had monetary. Uh, means to make a move if they needed somebody down the stretch, and uh, this just this just throws a monkey wrench into the whole deal. Well, you hang in there, my good man. It's nice of you to be so honest about your own uh, struggles too. You have an, a look at it that well, you uh, have to be, and that's what he has to learn to be too. And that's that's what it takes. All right. Well, we love you, Larry. Hang in there, and we'll see you in Grand Rapids soon. All right, Michael. All the best to uh, Larry Sorensen there at uh, 30 minutes after the hour. You know, we were supposed to be in Marquette this morning. Uh, We wanted to be far enough away from Lansing to not hear the screaming of the people upset about the governor's budget proposal. But we're right here two blocks from the Capitol now, so we might as well revel in it. If uh, you want to complain about it, if you want to say you like it, if you're a lobbyist or a lawmaker, 888-900-9966 is the number to call. But i got to tell you, I was really looking forward to broadcasting from the Landmark Inn because as a travel writer, it's a hotel that I've heard about for a long time. And uh, Christine Pasola is the general manager and the proprietor of the Landmark Inn, which is, as I understand it, right in downtown Marquette and in the middle of the action for the UP200 tonight. Good morning to you. Good morning, Michael. You know, uh, we, the reason I'm not there is that the Delta had uh, serious problems yesterday. I guess all the airlines did, uh, flying into Marquette because it was unusual, uh, unseasonably warm. The and so, fog was just incredible. I mean, you couldn't see two feet in front of you. Yeah, so I, I was at Detroit Airport all day, and uh, there was just a, there was a point when it got late into the evening that it was too risky oh. to try to pull it off. But uh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, well, I wanted You're going to miss all the festivities. Yeah, and, and uh, the uh, the Delta uh, announcer, the, the, the guy who was at the desk, kept saying, okay, everybody, we know about the big dog sled race. We're going to try to get you there. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, this is serious business if they've taken into account. I mean, it's a major, major event, isn't it? 
this is a major it's a major winter event for us um it's just fantastic. It really brings people in from all over the country, and certainly um, many, many people from the northern tier states that um, are into sled dog racing. And uh, I'm told it's a qualifier for the Iditarod, the famous yes, Alaskan yep. sled dog yep. race. I mean, these people are serious. <laughs> <laughs> and, you and, have to be if you're going out there and uh, it's yeah. cold weather driving on a sled with a bunch of dogs, but it's fabulous, really. And remember, unless you're the lead dog, the view isn't that good. Well, they actually, they get separated pretty good. Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you know what? People will not be separated at the landmark because every person that I talked to, every big shot that was on their way up there from, uh, from AT&T and Blue Cross Blue Shield said, where are you staying? Oh, I'm staying at the landmark. And oh, that's, uh, yeah, it, right where we're... Well, we're supposed to have a big reception tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah think about that part. It'll still um, be yes, on. We are supposed to have a big reception tonight with a lot of the um, legislators and stuff here um, at 4 o'clock. Well, maybe they'll get up here uh, before then. Oh, I think they'll be fine. I think there were, uh, uh, the Delta, flights are going now. They're going now, and they were scheduling extra ones for this morning, and there was a late-night flight that got in yesterday very, very late. Yeah. So you'll be all systems go. And uh, the weather, though, I'm told that there's a, they have to truck in some snow into town there because uh, while the dog, there's plenty of snow in the woods for the race, they come right. right through town, don't they? Right. They come right through town, which is really exciting, all along the main street in front of all the shops. And so they do truck that in every year. Okay. Um, and they, they build up a track, and they have, a, a like, a snow fence. And then people, there's just thousands of people that line the streets and cheer the dogs on. The, the dogs are just psyched. They're so excited. They're just yapping and ready to go. And once they <laughs> get that go-ahead, they just boom, take off, and then you wait maybe, you know, five, six minutes, and then the next set gets up there, and then they take off. So, hmm. um, The landmark uh, is known for, for its uh, prominence there in, in Marquette, but I, I have heard from time to time that the landmark is haunted. Is that true? Well, um, I don't know. I mean, I've heard that as well. Um, Every once in a while, it, it, whatever, you know, if you believe in ghosts, um, you could say it's haunted. Mm -hmm. If it is haunted, it's definitely a friendly ghost. <laughs> There's never been anything, uh, you know, negative, yeah. strange, bad happening. But uh, people have reported some unusual things. Oh, like what? Well, okay, here's one that was really uh, interesting. This woman... Her, the uh, husband and wife, mm -hmm. they're sleeping in the room, the mm -hmm. haunted room. Mm -hmm. And she was, you know, laying facing the window. And she kind of, her arm was kind of out of the bed. And she felt uh, like someone kind of just gently touch her hand. Ooh. And she opened her eyes and she was like, oh, my God, I see someone sitting in that chair, you know. Yay. Totally freaked. Yeah. So she, Turned back, turned over toward her husband. She's like, oh my God, I see someone sitting in there. You know, she, I mean, she had opened her eyes and, <laughs> like, you know, to try to see, am I dreaming? What's going on? And so then the husband, you know, turns over and he's like, you know, I don't really see it. And then she saw this figure get up and, you know, walk to the door. That is fun stuff. <laughs> Christine, congratulations. General manager and proprietor of the Landmark Inn, the... Uh Hot spot for the UP 200 going on today in Marquette, Michigan. It's Michael Patrick Shields. Uh, 20 minutes now before the hour, if you're a lobbyist or a lawmaker and you want to comment on Governor Snyder's budget proposal, 888-900-9966. Uh, we're reaching out to as many people as we can as well, but uh, I'm, I'm seeing uh, lots of reaction here, and uh, we got bombarded yesterday with press releases and statements and so forth. 888-900-9966. Make your voice heard all across the state of Michigan and certainly to the legislators and uh, maybe even the governor who listened to this program. The Red Wings started off a three-game road trip yesterday. They went to Tampa, and they had to play against Steve Eiserman's team. What, you say? 
Steve Eiserman, he's a Red Wing. Well, not anymore. He's the general manager of the Tampa Bay Lightning, and this is the first time they had to go head-to-head his old team where he spent his entire career as the captain, and Ken Cal was there to document it. Thanks, Michael Patrick. Pamel Datsuk netted two goals, and Dan Cleary had a goal and two assists, leading Detroit to a 6-2 win over the Tampa Bay Lightning last night in Tampa, Florida. Drake grabbed a 2-0 first period lead on a Dan Cleary power play goal and an even strength tally from Pavel Datsuk. The Lightning tied the game in the second as Victor Hedman and Steve Downey both beat Jimmy Howard, but the Red Wings fought their way back to grab a 4-2 lead before the period came to an end, and they got a power play goal from Nicholas Cronwall that proved to be the game winner, and an even strength tally from Justin Abdelkader. Datsuk and Darren Helm rounded out the scoring in the final period as the Red Wings recorded their 35th win of the season. Tampa Bay outshot the Red Wings 40-31 in front of 20,849 fans at the St. Pete Times Forum last night, and a lot of those fans were Red Wing fans at that. Mm -hmm. Final again, Detroit 6, Tampa Bay 2. That's the story from Tampa, Florida. Now back to you, Michael Patrick, in the studio. Well, you've got pretty good duty, Ken Cal, as the radio broadcaster for the Red Wings because you're going from Tampa today down to Miami. You've got the Florida Panthers tonight. Enjoy your you're, – you're down there with all the baseball teams while we have winter here in Michigan. Congratulations to Oakland University from Rochester, Michigan. They won the Summit League Championship yesterday with a win over North Dakota State and uh, probably be heading to the NCAA tournament, and uh, that's good for Michigan. You're planning ahead. You want to see Brady Hoke's team at the University of Michigan annual spring football game. That'll be April 16th, and uh, you get a chance to uh, have a look. 35,000 people attended that spring game last year. The NBA All-Star Game weekend kicks off tonight in Los Angeles. They have a rookie challenge and then, you know, the slam dunk contest and all that stuff. It's the 60th All-Star Game and the game itself proper will be on Sunday. Kurt Busch will start from the pole for Sunday's Daytona 500. He and Jeff Burton won Thursday's Gatorade dual qualifying races, if you follow that kind of thing. Dale Earnhardt Jr. had won the pole, but he crashed his car during practice, and now he's got to start from the back of the pack. And the expiration of the collective bargaining agreement is drawing near between the NFL and the Players Association. They're going to mediation in an effort to resolve their differences. Talks broke down last week. There's a lawsuit going on, and we just want to make sure there's going to be NFL football when there's supposed to be NFL football. Might even be an extra game of it next year or two if they go to an 18-game season, so stay tuned for details on all of that. Uh, 64 car dealerships that had sold Chryslers are suing the federal government for $130 million in damages. They say that uh, their contracts with Chrysler were unconstitutionally terminated without compensation. And uh, so they are using the taking clause of the Fifth Amendment of the uh, the United States Constitution that bans the government from taking private property for public use without just compensation. The dealers aren't suing Chrysler. They're suing the government for getting involved in the auto business and shutting them down. 43 minutes. Rich Studley is uh, with us now, the uh, executive director, the CEO of the uh, Michigan Chamber of Commerce with reaction to the governor's budget proposal yesterday. Good morning, Mr. S., Good morning, Michael Patrick. Well, what do you think? Uh, we, we, the state of Michigan elected Rick Snyder to uh, bring change, and this is a serious change, isn't it? Yes, it is. Overall, we're very supportive of the governor's proposed budget. When you say overall, are there some caveats? Well, I think like everyone, we want to look at some of the details and specifics, but it reduces spending, no general tax increase, this budget is pro-jobs, pro-business, and pro-taxpayer. What about the people who say, you know, it's pro-corporate uh, Michigan, but it's uh, going to be, uh, you know, carried on the backs of the middle class, the poor, the students? I don't think that's fair or accurate. It's all about shared sacrifice. There are changes to the tax structure that would impact on both individuals and business. We've got to focus on job creation and economic growth, and the governor's proposed budget does that. Okay, thank you very much for the early call this morning. Just one of the people studying the finer points of uh, Governor Snyder's budget proposal yesterday. That's Rich Studley from the Michigan Chamber of Commerce. You're welcome to get with us at 888-900-9966. They have an interesting situation going on in 
Uh, Madison, Wisconsin, the public schools there are closed again today because of ongoing protests over union bargaining and the state budget that they're dealing with. School officials say too many teachers are taking the day off uh, to protest Governor Scott Walker's proposal, so classes are going to be canceled for the third straight day. There was a budget battle heating up yesterday as 16 senators skipped voting on the controversial bill that would strip teachers and other public employees of their collective bargaining rights and cut their benefits. So we're not alone in trying to reinvent the state, but uh, it's also going to you know, be some serious controversy along the way. Honda recalling more than 97,000 vehicles in the U.S. to replace springs in the engine valve train, 2009 and 2010 fit models. And uh, California lawmaker wants to put a tax on soda and sugary drinks a penny per ounce because they're bad for us. And, uh, well, it could raise a little revenue for the government, too. 14 minutes before the hour, Michael Patrick Shields. It's Friday, and we'll talk to State Representative Stephen Lindbergh, the Democrat from Marquette, on his thoughts on the governor's proposal as soon as we get back. Stay with us. Good Friday morning to you, Michael Patrick Shields. Governor Rick Snyder unveiled a budget yesterday that fundamentally changes how the state raises and spends money. It also offers a $1.8 billion tax cut to businesses while taxing pensioners and restraining the spiraling costs of public employee compensation. Those are some of the aspects. We're going to be talking with uh, Charles Ballard, the Michigan State University economics professor, coming up shortly. But first, Senator Gretchen Whitmer, the Democrat from East Lansing, the Senate Democratic leader, is on the other end of our line this morning. Nice to talk to you. How are you today? I'm great, Michael Patrick. I'm glad we're friends. Otherwise, I might take the intro of Witchy Woman personally. No! Oh, <laughs> <laughs> total coincidence, I promise you. <laughs> However, they may not feel that way in the governor's office because your comments, having seen these budget details, are, are pretty sharp. Well, you know, when you take a look at the state budget, it is not just simply a corporate balance sheet. It's a statement of values, and it, it's, it reflects what the governor thinks is important. And for a governor who has talked a lot about shared sacrifice, you can't help but look at this budget and say, where is the shared sacrifice? You know, our kids, our workers, our seniors are going to see their taxes go up, their services go down, and it's all to fund corporate tax cuts. So despite the fact that he said, you know, his first of four principles was no net tax increase, that might be true for businesses, but it's not true for the people of our state who are going to foot a major tax increase while suffering the cuts to our schools and public safety. Uh, the governor comes from, uh, I, I think it's fair to say, an analytical background, a computer company. He looks at things uh, like an accountant might look at things, right, and cold, hard numbers and facts. That's kind of what he promised everybody uh, when, he, when he was running for governor, that he would come in and take a hard look. And, you know, uh, he, he wasn't beholden to anyone because he got elected with his own money for the most part. And so isn't that exactly what he's doing right now, just sort of saying, well, hey, uh, X times 2 equals B and that's job creation, and that's how we're going to do it. Yeah, well, I think there are some fundamental things wrong with that, that analysis. It's, it's not that simple. And when you look at it and you say, how is he going to fund this $2 billion in tax, business tax breaks? Well, it's by raising income taxes to the tune of $700 million on working people. It's, re- it's getting rid of the earned income tax credit, which is for the working poor, by eliminating that, you plunge 14,000 more kids into poverty in the state of Michigan for $358 million. And then you tax pensions for $900 million on seniors. So that's how he pays for his big business tax cut on top of cuts to education and universities and public safety. And so this is not about moving all of Michigan forward like he said he wanted to. This is about, looks like the same old playbook. Do you think that this version is just a sort of shock and awe, a honeymoon period proposal that he knows full well it won't pass as is? Well, I, I think he's got, you know, if he doesn't know, I'm sure a lot of people around him know that this is the opening salvo. You know, mm-hmm. the governor's budget is um, a suggestion to the legislature, and now it's incumbent on the House and the Senate to scrutinize the spending and scrutinize the priorities and change them if they think it needs to be changed. Um, I, you know, I, I like the talk of metrics, but, you know, I don't need a study with metrics to tell me that slashing education, eliminating people who protect kids and putting 14,000 more kids into poverty is not the right thing for Michigan. And I think my colleagues may come to that conclusion as well as they go through the budget. Um, you uh, have heard the governor say that he'd like to have the budget all finished by June. 
now that you see the opening salvo, as you call it, is that going to be possible? Oh, I think anything's possible. And, yeah. You know, he, he, he controls both chambers of the legislature. His party does. So a question, it's not really a question of what time the budget gets done. It's going to be what's in that budget and whether it moves all of Michigan forward like he said he wants to. So um, we've got our work cut out for us to meet that deadline, but it certainly can be met. He, you know, like I said, controls all the branches of Michigan government at the moment. In your role as the Senate Democratic leader, do you now have the position of being the loudest voice against some of these uh, proposals? I don't know. I, you know, I haven't really thought about that. I'll, I do what I do, which is uh, when I voice my concerns for, you know, my constituents, which I consider all of the people of Michigan, the kids and the seniors and the working families of this great state. And, um, you know, I, we all have a duty on behalf of everyone in the state to try to do the best that we can to make sure that we move the state of Michigan forward. So I, I, fi- I think we will find some areas of agreement, but there are certainly, at this juncture, um, a lot of areas of disagreement. And that's, that's how the process works best, to be honest. All right. Well, thank you for being available this morning. You're not a witchy woman. We love having you on the program. <laughs> I hope not, Michael Patrick. <laughs> we'll thank see, you. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much. That's the Senate Democratic leader, Gretchen Whitmer, another Democrat. Let's go to Marquette to speak to Stephen Lindbergh, the state representative from Marquette. Good morning to you. Good morning, Patrick. We're very excited about the UP uh, 200 there in Marquette. Uh, what, do you have any uh, reaction to what you've seen yesterday in terms of the governor's budget? Well, you know, I, uh, I have some some real concerns about uh, what I heard yesterday. Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't want to bu- balance the budget on the, on the backs of, of young people and uh, the, the, the working middle class and, and the working poor and our, and our seniors. I, um, and then I, I just have some concerns about that. Will you say hi to Pat Pritchard and Les Wong and everybody there at the UP 200 in Marquette? We were supposed to get there, but we were sort of foibled by the fog yesterday. But we want to play co- pay close attention to Marquette and get there soon and enjoy the dog sled race tonight, will you? I, I will. Thank, Thank you. you very much. See, we should have just driven up with you from Lansing instead of trying to be fancy and take an airplane. That's what we should have done. Next time, I'm going to ride with Stephen Lindbergh, the state representative from Marquette. It's Michael Patrick Shields, and it's Friday. Good morning, Michigan. A very pleasant Friday to you, Michael Patrick Shields. Uh, There were many of you tuning in this morning on Fox 47 or on the radio who were expecting us to be broadcasting live from the UP 200 in Marquette, Michigan. That's a dog sled race. That's a qualifier for the Iditarod and a major event. There are a number of state lawmakers there and corporate involvement, too, from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and AT&T. And here's how the story went. Pat Pritchard and Molly Pritchard from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Now, Pat is a major sponsor of the event there. He's the director of Upper Peninsula Operations for Blue Cross. Got in his car on Wednesday, and they drove to Marquette, which I'm told is uh, seven hours, something like that. And he sent me a funny text that said, seven hours in a car, one and a half hours in an airplane. Oh, it's about the same thing. And he was ripping on me because I was going to be flying, but I had to do the morning show Thursday, then fly to Marquette. So I left the state capitol, Lansing, yesterday on Delta, flew to Detroit, and then found out that flight after flight after flight to Marquette was canceled because of fog in Marquette. So as the wee small hours went on, I was spent the whole day stranded in Detroit Airport from 1 o'clock until about 10.30 last night, When, uh, like NASA, we had to draw the line and say it's a no-go from main engine startup for the Friday morning show because we wouldn't have had time to, you know, test and rehearse and connect all the equipment and that sort of thing became. So here we are in the studio, but we are connected to Pat Pritchard, who is there at the Landmark Hotel at the Chop House, which is... uh, Really going to be a great spot today and tonight for the UP 200, and there's lots of, uh, as I said, business people and and legislators around. Pat, how's it going? Michael Patrick, how are you this morning? The show has gone to the dogs, it seems, I'm afraid. And and I was joking earlier that I really wanted to be in Marquette because I wanted to be as far away from the screaming and crying at the state capitol from the lobbyists and everybody else after the budget came out yesterday. But I imagine it's, it's the talk of the town up there, too. It's the talk of the town, and I feel so bad. I did do that text. You're absolutely correct about the seven-hour drive and one-and-a-half-hour flight, and uh, I never went to sleep last night. I'm still standing here right by the front desk waiting for your arrival. <laughs> like Just like a loyal dog waiting, right? <laughs> well, uh, I, I feel so sorry for you guys. Uh, that was, that was, uh, and there were other people that were coming up as well, like you said, from 
AT&T that didn't make it as well. So I, I, I feel bad, and uh, we're here and ready to go. And uh, just didn't work out, but uh, and next year we'll try to get out in front of it a little bit, and you have to drive with me. Next year I think I'm going to do Air Pritchard, which uh, <laughs> travels at about 75 knots and about two feet above the ground. And actually the only time you're higher than that is when you go over the Mackinac Bridge, because then I know I can get there for sure. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, well, it was pretty foggy, and uh, just just wasn't going to happen. I hope you'll carry on uh, without us. I understand they're trucking in snow into Marquette so the dogs can run right through town. And it's a major event, a point of pride for Pure Michigan, that event, isn't it? it is, yeah, it is really nice, and it is a big event. And a lot of people will be down here. Uh, people like ourselves and Blue Cross Blue Shield are, and with the community downtown are going to have a great time. And uh, I was going to take you around all the, uh, the haunts, if you will, uh, <laughs> around town to the breakfast places, the lunch places, and also the, the four to six places as well. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> well, hang in there. Uh, say hi to everyone for us. Les Wong from Northern Michigan University and all the other folks, Mike Prusy and everybody else who's up there at uh, Marquette for the dog sled race. And uh, you, I always say, uh, you know, unless you're the lead dog, the view ain't so good in that sport, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's pretty good. Well, we'll miss you, Mike, and we'll do it next year. All right. Thank you very much. See you back in town. Pat Pritchard is there with Molly from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Major sponsors there, a special event of the, uh, it's not the Iditarod, it's a qualifier for the Iditarod, the UP 200. Okay, Governor Snyder's budget. We've been talking about it already this all week, really, ever since the lieutenant governor said that this would be akin to an atomic bomb going off over Lansing. Charles Ballard, the economics professor from Michigan State University. Well, did it qualify as an atomic bomb, the governor's budget? budget proposal? Uh, I, I don't think it's a, a, an atomic bomb. Actually, I think that may have been a good rhetorical device to sort of prepare people oh. because they people knew uh, that there were going to be big things. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it's no more than a neutron bomb because <laughs> I see that the, the buildings are still standing. You know, uh, there are some very dramatic changes in it. Uh, I look at it and I see some things that I uh, really applaud and others that I'm disappointed in. Of course, that's almost inevitable because when you start from a $1.8 billion deficit, uh, the option that's marked uh, fun and no pain and, and everybody's happy is just not on the table. When the governor says that there are no tax increases in his budget proposal, is that, uh, is that fair? Is that true? Well, there's, uh, if, from what I can tell looking at the numbers, there, are, there aren't any, there's not a net increase mm -hmm. in, uh, in taxes. But, of course, there are decreases in some places and increases in others. Um, I, on net, think that our, we will have a much more efficient tax system with this set of changes, uh, eliminating the Michigan business tax, getting rid of some of the tax credits, and uh, putting retirement income on the same footing as income from work. Uh, my, the downside for me is that when all those changes have been factored in, the amount of revenue that they will raise is... Uh, less than what I think is necessary to fund the level of public services that I think the people of Michigan deserve. And so you have some very substantial cuts in programs. The earned income tax credit eliminated, which I think is a, a very unfortunate, and some really big cuts to uh, K through 12 universities and uh, the revenue sharing for uh, local governments. That's what leads me to wonder if this isn't just, uh, let's give him a little shock and awe. He's still in the honeymoon period. Let's throw all the cards down there and see what we can get. Well, you never know. Uh, well, even if you had Governor Snyder on here, I'm not sure whether he would reveal to you yeah. what the strategy is. But it's, it's very uh, common for a political leader to issue a, a, a recommendation where that's not their final goal, mm -hmm. where they think there might be some negotiation along the, the way. Uh, uh, like I say, this has some very nice features uh, and some things that I don't like. Um, I, I think it's possible that the legislature could change it in ways that would make it even better. It's also nope. possible that they could change it in ways that, at least from my perspective, would make it worse. What would you say is the common ground in the budget proposal that everybody can get behind, if there is any? Oh. Now, that's a good question because, uh, you know, uh, there's almost nothing when you're talking about taxes and budgets because yeah. if you increase a tax somewhere, somebody doesn't like it. If mm -hmm. you cut a service somewhere, somebody doesn't like it. And if you start from a $1.8 billion deficit, you're going to have people who don't like almost everything. Um, I, I do think that a lot of people will rally behind uh, uh, making the tax system 
more rational, more uh, transparent, uh, more uniform, more efficient. I think those are, uh, especially getting rid of some of the miscellaneous tax breaks. I know every tax break has some lawyers and lobbyists behind it. Uh, but really, w we've gone awfully far in Michigan in the last 30 years. Uh, you know, anybody who shows up in a Brooks Brothers suit and says, give me tax credits and I'll create jobs, we throw, we throw money at them. Mm -hmm. And it really hasn't been uh, very effective. And there's been no oversight. And so Governor Snyder is trying to move toward a, a more rational system in, in that dimension. And I think that's, uh, that's a plus. That's a big plus from the economist's perspective, probably not from the lobbyist who's in favor of a particular tax break. Is the movie business the big loser? Movie business is definitely a loser. Uh, I don't think that means that the state of Michigan is a loser. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I've, I've argued for a long time. This is so incredibly generous to the, to the movies. We cover more than 40% of their operating expenses. Well, goodness, if you cover 40% of your operating expenses, we could, we could grow grapefruit up in Marquette, and it would be profitable because, <laughs> uh, you know, even with the fog that they have that yeah. they had yesterday and you couldn't get up there, you, you could have gigantic greenhouses, and the state of Michigan is, is paying so much that they could burn enough natural gas to keep their greenhouse warm <laughs> all winter long. Uh, but the question is, is that a sensible use of our resources? I, I, I don't generally, and, and so in this, this is a place where most economists are very consistent with the, the, the governor's approach. Make it a level playing field. If you're going to have business taxation, try to make it as smooth and transparent as, as you can instead of having high taxes on some to finance uh, special deals for others. The so-called picking of winners and losers. The picking of winners and losers. Uh, you see, I, it's just not clear to me that the, the elected officials are great at picking winners and losers. I, I'm not sure that the private sector always is, is good. I mean, a lot of people put their money into something and it doesn't work. But um, it's... It's probably better, uh, and there's a lot of economic research, some of which I've done, indicating that if you've got high taxes in one place and low taxes in another, that generates an inefficient allocation of resources. Um, the MEA, considered to be the strongest lobby, uh, very upset at what we're looking at. The, 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 are these cuts, when you, we used to hear the word draconian in the past, are the cuts to education draconian? Well, if they're not draconian, they certainly are, are very severe. Yeah. And I can understand, and I have friends uh, uh, who are teachers. I have friends who are uh, members of the MEA. Um, this definitely reduces uh, K-12 through education funding far more than I uh, would like to see. You know, education is the number one thing that's going to prepare Michigan for the economy of, you know, let's not just prepare for 2012. We've got to be preparing for 2030, 2050. Uh, and if we have a highly educated workforce, we'll be well suited. If not, um, we won't. And, and, you know, you can't do it without money. Professor Charles Ballard, the esteemed Michigan State University economics professor at 18 minutes after the hour. State Senator, the Senate Majority Leader, Randy Richardville, the Republican from Monroe, will join us coming shortly. And Gary Muller, the CEO of Marquette General Hospital. Stay tuned. It's Michael Patrick Shields. And uh, we are with... Charles Ballard, you know him as the esteemed economics professor from Michigan State University. Thanks for being with us this morning. Let me just ask you real quickly here now. The governor has vowed he's going to work for $1, uh, give up his salary, which I guess would have been about $159,300. Right. I guess on one level he's trying to show that it's shared sacrifice. But on the other level, I'm asking, does it come off as a little bit trite? Because anybody who can say, I don't really need the 159000 you take it, I mean, it obviously doesn't really need it. Well, it, it is true that uh, I, I think uh, uh, the, the real impact of that $159,000 on the budget is, is negligible. Mm -hmm. um, he's trying to make a point of... Uh, that we're all in this together, and, and, and so I think the symbolic value is, is fine. Uh, everybody understands that that's, you know, that's a matter of seconds in terms of the, uh, the size of that, that budget deficit that we uh -huh. face. And so it's not huge practical impact, but if it has symbolic significance that some people r relate to, that's fine. Uh, Randy Richardville, the Senate Majority Leader, the Republican from Monroe, who Charles Ballard points out to me often wears a vest, is on the other end of our line. Good morning to you, Senator. Good morning, Michael Patrick. How are you today? <laughs> are you vested already this morning? Uh, not quite, not quite. I thought I would wait till I was done talking to you before I got ready for the day, but 
There's a decent chance I'll probably wear a sweater vest. <laughs> okay. Now, did you get that advice from Senator Allen and the captain's quarters in Traverse City, or did you come up with that on your own? No, you know, I love Senator Allen, but uh, sometimes his dress is a little funkier than me. You know, I'm not a big bow tie dude, and sometimes <laughs> his plaids were louder than uh, than the, the noise on the floor of the Senate. So I, uh, I have a tendency to not like to wear coats in the wintertime. That's really what it's all about. Yeah, I know what you mean. I don't like to be getting in and out of a car, going in and out of buildings, looking for a coat, losing a coat. And uh, you talked about the noise. There's lots of noise today after the governor's budget proposal yesterday. Let's start with your friend and um, your colleague on the other side of the aisle, Senate Minority Leader Gretchen Whitmer, was with us a few minutes ago. And she says that uh, it's the same old putting corporate tax breaks ahead of the people. And uh, she put some pretty incendiary language out there yesterday. The honeymoon is over, I guess, huh? Well, I, you know, I, I've got a lot of respect for Senator Whitmer. Uh, we're, we're pretty good friends outside of the political world as well. Uh, we would, uh, I would respectfully disagree here. There are some businesses that actually are going to be getting hit fairly hard, and there are some that are going to get a bit of a break. But if you look at the state of Michigan right now, I think everyone knows that our number one problem is the economy and uh, the creation of jobs. So who would you help for that? You probably have to help the job providers, right? I mean, that to me is a, a straightforward uh, top priority. So what the governor did was simplify the tax structure, eliminated the tax uh, requirements, the Michigan business tax, for almost 100,000 businesses. They don't even have to fill it out anymore. We made it 6% across the board, and... Uh, uh, I think that is an inviting kind of uh, message being sent to the business community. And let me further that a bit. I talked to the business leaders of Michigan, mm -hmm. which is about 100, uh, there were about 100 chief executive officers, chairmen of boards, people like that. I mean, the you know, biggest and brightest in uh, uh, the business world in Michigan. And they said that uh, this week was a lot like an investment meeting for them. If they wanted to talk to the Speaker of the House, to the Governor, and to me about our priorities over the next uh, few months and few years and decide whether they were going to invest in Michigan or companies other, in other places where they had other divisions. And they were very, very pleased by the initial, um, at least the general, uh, outlay of what we're planning to do here in Michigan. So you're going to see business investment largely uh, because we are creating a business environment that People want to invest in. Uh, Professor Ballard, if you're running the Professor Charles Ballard Corporation and you're listening to those remarks from uh, uh, from uh, Senator Richardville, do you agree? I, I think that the uh, the change in the in the Michigan business tax, uh, uh, the MBT and is an acronym for Mighty Bad Tax. It had some very unfortunate uh, features that were sort of uh, cobbled together th uh, three and a half years ago. Uh, and so I, I won't shed any tears when it's gone. My concern is that at, at the end of the day, we'll have a level of revenue that is forcing us to make enormous cuts to uh, aid to local governments, to K through 12 education, to universities, and eliminate the earned income tax credit. Uh, I think all of those are unfortunate. So the it, it's a mix. I'll, I'll uh, give something that I think Senator Richardville would, would like, saying bye-bye uh, to the MBT, and that's fine. But I think Senator Whitmer would probably, who is my senator, I'm in her district, mm -hmm. uh, she would probably like it better uh, when I say uh, the overall revenue. It's not just the business tax. It's how much revenue do we raise in total to put police and firefighters um, out there to make sure that 911 gets answered to pay for bridges and roads and schools. And I think we've, uh, we've gone very far. You know, uh, the general fund budget is already down by more than 40 percent, even going into this budget. So, so in terms of the Michigan business tax, yes, get rid of it, but replace the revenues, and I would have liked to see to have seen more revenue. Um, um, Senator Richerville, the Michigan Municipal League Board of Trustees uh, is saying that it will be impossible for some cities to survive under the plan to eliminate that $307 million in statutory revenue sharing. Um, and what do, you th what do you think? Yeah, this is the critical piece that a lot of people are missing. And maybe uh, I could uh, share this and the professor might, might take a look at this piece of it a little differently. Michigan is the most governed state in the United States, with the exception of Pennsylvania. We have more elected officials per capita 
than any other state in the country but one. A lot of people look at the state government and say, oh, my gosh, the state government's making these cuts, et cetera, et cetera. And now all these local governments, and let's take a look at local governments. We have villages, we have townships, we have cities, we have counties, we have ISDs, we have school boards, we have road commissions, we have councils of government. I mean, when you add it all up, we are paying for a lot of layers of government. And, yes, if you talk to just the Michigan, Michigan Municipal League, they care about the cities and revenue and building up that government base at the local level. But they need to consolidate and work on the overlapping services uh, with townships and with counties and with the road commissions and with school boards and ISDs, et cetera, et cetera, and find out where we can pay for services one time, not four, five, eight, 15 times. Let me give you a couple stats that I think support that. Kent County, and we'll go outside of <laughs> Senator Whitmer's district and outside of my district. We'll go to Kent County. <laughs> Kent County, one of 83 counties in the, in the state, has... 683 elected officials. Now think about that. Congress has, what, 435? And this is one and a half times the size of Congress just to govern one county. If you look at individually those units of government, I agree. They're going to have trouble making ends meet because we pay for the same services over and over, and it's time that they consolidate it. Now that county, Kent County, is actually taking a step in trying to do some consolidation independently. Wayne County has 40 chiefs of police. I mean, does that make sense to you? I don't know. It doesn't to me. Uh, you, we have 1,250 townships in those 83 counties across the state. So I think we're over-governed, but it's not just the state level where these cuts are going to be hit. We have to start to consolidate and eliminate these redundancies and these fiefdoms that are throughout the state of Michigan. Professor? Well, um, certainly there are efficiencies that can be achieved. Uh, and I, I, I'm not going to disagree with Senator Richardville about the, uh, the need to consolidate and to have sharing of services and, and all that. Um, I'm just concerned that uh, even when we squeeze all the efficiencies out, uh, you still have to pay enough money to put police officers on the street and, and so on. I, I don't think it's all uh, waste and duplication. Um, so I'm concerned that we may have pushed awfully far in, in this regard. Hmm. Uh, Senator, uh, very quickly, the AARP is saying that Governor Snyder has declared war on Michigan's senior citizens. The governor says that's not true. What do you think? Well, he, he made a, a great answer to this question, I think. He, what he's trying to do is level the playing ground. He, he's, he's sticking with his uh, tenet that fair is part of what we're, we're trying to build. So you got two senior citizens, both 65 years old, living next door to each other. One of them works in order to maintain, because he didn't have a pension when uh, he was working. The other one next door gets a pension. Uh, the one that's working pays 4.35% in income taxes to Michigan for the services that he consumes. And the one next door has an exemption. You tell me, is that fair? So I wouldn't call that declaring war. Uh, I would say that the governor, although I don't necessarily agree with everything that he's put out, and not necessarily this seizure either, because I've had less than 24 hours to actually start to analyze this. Yeah. But I want to take a look at it in total and not just try and pick apart pieces and create the political rhetoric that's been out there for years. I want to see if this really makes sense or doesn't. We'll keep the doors open and listen to the constituents as well. All right. Our phone is open for you. Thank you very much for the time. That's Senate Majority Leader Randy Richardville, the Republican from Monroe, and Charles Ballard. Thank you. Good to see you in person, too, without a vest here from oh, well, Michigan State Well, thank you University. very much. It's a pleasure, Mike, Michael Patrick. All the best. We'll talk again soon. 35 after the hour, Michael Patrick Shields. It's uh, 20 minutes before the hour right now. The Dow Jones Industrials yesterday rose 30 points. The S&P added 4 points, and the NASDAQ gained 6 points. We never let the birthday of a beautiful woman pass without taking note. Juice Newton is 59 today, and uh, should we give it to Molly Ringwald? She's 43. Remember her pretty in pink and all the rest of that. So happy birthday, darlings, to all of you. It's uh, 20 minutes now before the hour. The Red Wings were in an interesting position yesterday. They were in Tampa, Florida, going up against the Tampa Bay Lightning. And the general manager of the Tampa Bay Lightning is Steve Eiserman. Yeah, Stevie Y, the captain. And so radio broadcaster Ken Cal was there. Thanks, Michael Patrick. Pamel Datsuk netted two goals, and Dan Cleary had a goal and two assists, leading Detroit to a 6-2 win over the Tampa Bay Lightning last night in Tampa, Florida. Detroit grabbed a 2-0 first period lead on a Dan Cleary power play goal and an even strength tally from Pavel Datsuk. The Lightning tied the game in the second as Victor Hedman and Steve Downey both beat Jimmy Howard. 
But the Red Wings fought their way back to grab a 4-2 lead before the period came to an end. And they got a power play goal from Nicholas Cronwall that proved to be the game winner. An even strength tally from Justin Abdelkader. Datsuk and Darren Helm rounded out the scoring in the final period as the Red Wings recorded their 35th win of the season. Tampa Bay outshot the Red Wings 40-31 in front of 20,849 fans at the St. Pete Times Forum last night. And a lot of those fans were Red Wing fans at that. Final again, Detroit 6, Tampa Bay 2. That's the story from Tampa, Florida. Now back to you, Michael Patrick, in the studio. Thank you, sir. It is a Firekeepers Casino Friday on this program. They are in Battle Creek on the, right on 94, where 69 crosses in. So uh, that might be a choice of entertainment for you this weekend. I understand they're having some interesting raffles and so forth and lots of entertainment and sports on TV. You can watch the NBA All-Star Game, for instance, on Sunday at Firekeepers Casino on their flat screen TVs. It all kicks off actually tonight, if you'll pardon the football vernacular. The uh, rookie challenge is tonight, and uh, that pits first and second year players against each other. Saturday, it's the skills challenge and the three-point, the slam dunk, and all the rest of that. Also, you could watch the Daytona 500 at Firekeepers. You know, they have a special relationship with uh, Michigan International Speedway. Firekeepers does. They usually... They gave away a pace car last year, didn't they? Or a ride in the pace car and all that sort of fire keepers. So they're always doing something creative. And I know you love uh, racing. I do love the racing. What was that you just shouted out? Boogity, 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 let's go racing. Is that what they're going to say before the Daytona 500? That's what uh, Mr. Walker will say before the Daytona 500. This famous Up August the, race? The, before the Daytona 500, they will say, gentlemen, start your engine. That's the Indy 500. No, that's all races. Oh, they do? Yes. But there are ladies in there, too. Gentlemen, Danica Patrick is racing. She's not racing in the NASCAR series. She's racing in the Nationwide series. She's in the Daytona 500, though, right? There are... No, no, no. She's, she's not? not? No, she's yes, she is. In, this, in the Daytona weekend. The 500 is on Sunday. I can't keep all this straight. It, you know... Is, if da- if Danica's there, I'll be there. That's all I need to know. <laughs> then you want to watch the race on Saturday. So you're telling me that uh, they tow in a 500. They say that. They don't. Bo- say they don't say out. boogity. The, it, he's um he's a broadcaster in the booth who analyzes what's going on. Oh. That's the phrase that he always says. They don't say it in the stadium. Then. No, it's not. He's like it's the like the a entire Dick- stadium gets up and says. Oh, it's like a Dick Vitale thing. Kinda, kind of. Yeah, yeah. It's a boogity, little, little boogity. Race. Let's go racing. Okay, you can watch that at Firekeepers Casino this weekend, too. Kurt Busch is going to get the pull on Sunday's and Daytona 500. Casey Kane is going to win. Is he? Uh, Jeff good. Burton. Well, see, Dale Earnhardt Jr. won the pull, but he crashed, so now he's got to go from the back of the pack. That's what I know because that's what I read, <laughs> and that's all I know about it. But it was fun to talk to Roger Curtis yesterday from uh, Michigan International Speedway. He's in Daytona right now, too. Remember that movie, Smoking the Bandit? This is the theme uh, from Smoking the Bandit. Tony Cuthbert is playing for us here about the racing. And Tom Casperson is on the other end of our line. He is uh, the state senator from Marquette. He's made that drive many, many times. And, Senator, I should have driven yesterday instead of trying to fly because the fog has kept me out of Marquette. And that is, uh, you know, so unusual. We miss you up here. Thank you very much. How many hours does it take to drive from the state capitol to Marquette? Uh, Probably about seven hours. Yeah. See, that's that's less time than I spent sitting at Detroit Airport waiting to find out if I was going to fly. There you go. We traveled yesterday uh, late afternoon and shot up here, and uh, it went well. We ran into a little bit of fog, but it went well. Can you hear the screaming from around the Capitol after yesterday's budget proposal all the way in Marquette? We can, actually. I actually had some conversations last night. I went to a CAC meeting with uh, the DNR and uh, some uh, local people up in the Newberry area last night. We stopped in, and uh, certainly that was uh, the budget announcement was high on their priority and concern. Uh, yeah, I know you probably haven't had a chance to look at all the details yet, but as a, as a, in general, do you support what the governor is trying to do? I do. Um, I mean, it's I was there through o two to o eight. And a lot of kick in the can was going on, and it didn't solve anything. In fact, Michael, you've seen how the state just keeps sliding backwards. And uh, so I think going into this thing with the campaign and everything I heard on the campaign trail, I think was pretty obvious and uh, very similar to everybody else, that people were tired of that. They wanted, they knew it was going to be some tough decisions, but make them and let's move on. It's great to hear your voice again, and maybe uh, next year for the UP200, what we'll just do is take a dog sled from the state capitol to Marquette. You will be there for 
for sure if you do that. <laughs> All the best to you. Enjoy the UP200 tonight. That's Tom Casperson, who is in Marquette. It's a, a qualifier for the Iditarod, so it's serious business. And it's part of Pure Michigan on this Firekeepers Casino Friday. 14 before the hour, Michael Patrick Shields, more sports, and uh, a look inside your weekend coming, too. It's Michael Patrick Shields. So very nice to have you with us. Uh, the UP 200 is going on in Marquette, Michigan. That's uh, going to be tonight. And uh, they had to you know, bring in snow into the street there because it was unseasonably warm. That stopped a lot of people from getting there by aircraft until very, very late in the wee small hours of the morning. But nevertheless... The race is on, and Sarah Hubbard. Actually, we've got a dual storyline going today because uh, the governor's budget proposal was released yesterday. And Sarah Hubbard is a principal with Acuitas, and she's a, uh, obviously a very uh, um, wired lobbyist, if you will. She was uh, most recently with, for many years, the Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce, and she's in Marquette having driven up. And good morning to you. Bravo on your choice of transportation. <laughs> Good morning, Michael. I'm so sorry you didn't make it. I was hearing about the saga all day yesterday from my friend from AT&T. So um, it is an unfortunate you couldn't make it, but I'm glad the show goes on. It must go on, right? Yeah, Jim Murray and I were in the uh, Delta Lounge together, and we didn't even realize it till we started checking our Facebook, and we suddenly realized that uh, you know we were in the same situation. So it's kind of funny how you can get connected through technology even when you're sitting in the same room and. It, it's not one room; it's a you know labyrinth of rooms. But uh, it was technology got us together there. Yeah, exactly. Yep, and uh, well, you know, kept everybody updated. And Jim uh, is back downstate with you, I think, as well. But you know, Marquette is a beautiful place, and they are bringing the snow onto the streets. I just saw the big um, M dot front end loaders piling it up on the main drag. But it yeah. is uh, it's weird. It's been unseasonably warm here this week, and so. The yards, I can see grass in the yards, and there's not a lot of snow in other places, but they'll make it work for the dogs, and we'll still have a great time tonight with the sled dog race. Let me ask you something. Do you have dogs? Do you have a dog? You know what? I have cats. I'm kind of a cat person. I travel a lot, but I had dogs growing up. Oh, you did? Okay. And so you're going to be around those doggies today when they're running through town. They're going to say, who let the dogs out? And there are lobbyists and there are people across the state capitol here now who are saying, wait a minute, the voters voted for change, but not in my department. That's really what they'll say when they see the cuts coming their way, won't they, from Governor Snyder? Oh, yeah, you bet. You know, Governor Snyder is talking about eliminating almost every credit to those taxes. And Every credit has some advocate behind it. Yeah. You know, every the uh, credit for the arts, the credit for um, the food bank and the income tax, the, you know, credits for uh, megas and the business tax. I mean, they all have lobbyists who are now going to say, wait a minute, I didn't think you said me. Yeah. And they're going to be coming in and meeting with legislators and trying to keep their credits intact and um, those are the people that aren't going to be real excited about Governor Snyder today. Is the movie, you know, we, we heard earlier the movie business is in for a severe blow. Are they going to pack up uh, their all of their makeup and costumes and cameras and scram when they find out they're not going to get the tax break they thought they were? Well, that's a good question. I, it does look like um, Governor Snyder has recommended in his budget some options still for the movie industry. Uh, the way I read it, the way I understood it, is that there's some grant money that may still be available. Yeah. So uh, my guess is they'll be a bit more choosy in which movies they actually are giving some benefit to. But we have been able to build up some kind of an industry here. And uh, there's still opportunity, but it is an arms race. Every state tries to mm -hmm. lure that industry in, and it's really cool for a while. But it's an arms race, and if you can't afford to buy the arms, then maybe you should get out of that business. Well, that's what I'm wondering. It's uh, setting aside $25 million for film credits. That's that's f that's a quarter, isn't it, of what we uh, spent last year on the movie business? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's a drop in the bucket, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how will the movie industry, you know, respond to that? Will they wait and see what happens over the next several months? Yeah. And, and some of them may go, they may already be so far along, they just come in and hope, they can get their movie done before any changes are made. Like, you know, George Clooney. I can't wait till George Clooney comes in next month. I mean, they're not going to have this thing changed by the time he's here, so <laughs> I'm sure that one's going to go ahead. But people who are looking at doing movies, say, next year, they, they've got to be in a real wait-and-see mode. He's in Ann Arbor next month. Are you going to volunteer to be an extra on that set? You know what? I met George Clooney about 15 years ago, and I would love to revisit with him, but I don't think I can take the time off. 15 years ago, you met George Clooney? How did that happen? 
I have a picture to prove it. Um, I have a friend that was working on a movie set um, from, from dusk till dawn was a movie. He was in Quentin Tarantino, a bunch of others. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was on the set. My friend was a uh, friend of a friend, actually, was uh, working on the movie as a seamstress, you know, in the costume department and out in Los Angeles. And I was out there for a conference, as was my friend from the Small Business Association. And we went uh, to the set. We waited around for a couple hours and finally had an opportunity to meet him and get a picture. So I have a picture to prove it. And uh, he loved talking about lobbying and government and how neat it was. And, and it was, you know, a couple years after that, he did that K Street um, on HBO, the oh, yeah. kind of quasi documentary. So he's always very interested in politics. Did you, uh, since you were getting along so well, was there a romantic connection? Oh, there was in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Have fun at the UP 200. Say hi to Pat Pritchard at, uh, from Blue Cross Blue Shield and Jim Murray or anybody who's there from AT&T and all the rest. And enjoy the race. We'll see you when Thank the you. Uh, race goes on here for the budgers, bu- the governor's budget. Who's left in? Who's left out? Who has a seat? Who doesn't? It'll all be happening now. For television viewers, thanks for being with us this morning. Radio listeners, stay right where you are. There's another hour of your Friday, and you can always find us at michigantalknetwork.com. I'm Michael Patrick Shields. Get back, Ruffy, get back, you play, invest in mongrel.